Well, it's great to be here. I just saw my mom snuck in. Okay, I got to change my sermon now. Okay. <laughs> now, First uh, Kings chapter 19. First Kings chapter 19. You know, um, going to camp, so much fun. Uh, I really enjoyed Brother Lee Edwards was in the cabin with uh, Pastor Howell and I and Brother Galdamez. And it's interesting uh, as Pastor Howell and I will, uh, we both tend to uh, enjoy sarcasm just a little bit. That's a little bit. And uh, uh, Brother Galdamez will just sit over on the other side and just shake his head back and forth. Just, oh boy. But Brother Edwards is such a nice guy. You know, he would never say a, a mean thing about anybody. But I, uh, I was telling them in the cabin, you know, uh, back a number of years ago, we didn't know who our next pastor was going to be. And I'd pray for pastor to give wisdom. And I'd pray for God to give us uh, a smart pastor. Pastor was so smart. IQ really high and he's just on top of things and so I said I'm praying for God to give us a, a really smart pastor and Lee Edwards cut me off and said keep praying keep praying <laughs> and I was like I like this guy this is, this is, I like being in the cabin with him until a few minutes later he told me you know brother I really like you it's like you know it's one of those things you kind of blush and then he said but I don't understand why the teenagers do and I was like <laughs> But of course, that's assuming the teenagers do like me, so uh, they probably don't. But Edwards, that might be why you don't understand. But I really enjoyed this last week. It was great to spend time with the teenagers. Uh, great to spend time with uh, Brother Edwards and Pastor Howell. And uh, I'd like to see if uh, Brother Galdemus can shake his head yes, because he's always shaking his head no at us. But uh, I enjoyed spending time with everybody up there. Of course, my son, Ryan, uh, some of you may not know, Pastor Ryan is my son. Uh, I know he's, he's bigger than I am. Uh, and so I'm kind of interested to see what grandson's going to look like. I don't know if you, if you know my dad. My dad's the one that plays percussion. He's not bigger than me, okay? He's smaller than me. I got bigger. Ryan got bigger. So, <laughs> you know, I don't know if this is going to keep going that way or not, but uh, Ryan, and you know, you're going to have a lot, uh, buy a lot of food, and groceries are going to be really high for that. Um, this last week, I was preaching at school camp, and uh, one of the young teens came up to me and said, man, I really liked your sermon, he said, especially when it was finished. Yeah. <laughs> and that's usually everybody's favorite part. <laughs> so I told Brother Kuntz, I'll pound on the pulpit or something right before I'm done so he can enjoy the end. Okay, you enjoy the end? We'll try to give you a <laughs> so you can wake up, you know. But uh, there was a, a young boy named Alexander, age 10, he wrote to his pastor. He said, please pray for our little league team. We need God's help. Or a pitcher. One of the two. He didn't know which one, but we need God's help or a pitcher. Now, I'm going to be talking a little bit about that. A lot of people, they pray for God's help, but oftentimes depend on something besides, God, besides God's help. And uh, we all need God. There's nothing in our lives we need more than God. But don't misunderstand your place because God doesn't need you. You're not irreplaceable. Now, he loves you. You're valuable to him. He has a plan, and you're part of his plan. God is necessary. I am not. You know, this church can do without me. Matter of fact, they do real well without me when I'm not here. <laughs> Cambodia can do without me. But nobody can do without God. They say, well, where's that in the Bible? Well, we're going to see. Okay? I think it's in here somewhere. We'll look real hard. We'll dig, dig, dig. Okay? And I'm sure I can find it somewhere. First, First Kings chapter 18. We're going to be, our text is uh, 19, but I want to remind you what happened in chapter 18. And in chapter 18, uh, we see that uh, Elijah, he has a uh, confrontation. Of course, he's been hiding during the famine three and a half years, and he comes back and calls Ahab to Mount Carmel, and he asks him to bring the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the grove, 400. 900, uh, 850 total. I got my math off a little bit there for a second. 850 total. Verse 21 in chapter 18 is the famous uh, uh, quote from uh, Elijah, which says, How long... Uh, will ye halt between two opinions? That's a great question. If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. 
And then in verse 22 in chapter 18, and we're real close in chapter 19, so if you want to look over there, this is an important verse because it shows a little bit about what Elijah is thinking, and actually he's getting a little off track already here. He says, I only remain a prophet of the Lord. Now, why is that off track? Why, why is he off track there? Well, it's, it's clear because earlier in the chapter in verse 13, Obadiah, who was a servant of Ahab, he had secretly hidden a hundred prophets of the Lord away and fed them in caves. Now, he didn't put them in caves and seal it up and let them die. He put them in caves. He, he got them aside. And so two groups of 50, he told Elijah that in verse 13. Elijah knows there's a hundred more prophets that have been saved. Now, he probably didn't know. He's been hiding away for three and a half years. He doesn't know what's happening. But Obadiah just told him. But yet in verse 22, after, he still says, I, I only. Now, the problem that we're going to see in chapter 19, we already started seeing it in verse, in chapter 18. And he's ignoring that there are other prophets, that there are other people that are serving God. There are other people being faithful, but he doesn't seem to recognize it. The only one he sees being faithful to God is himself. He's starting down a lonely road. And it's a lonely road that he doesn't have to be on. And so here in chapter 18, we also see, he tells the prophets of Baal, why don't you call upon your God and he'll answer by fire. If he answers by fire, then Baal's God, but I'll call upon the Lord Jehovah. And if he answers by fire, then Lord Jehovah is God. And we know the story about how the prophets of Baal, they're cutting themselves and everything. If it would have been... Uh, uh, Pastor Howell there, he would have gone and sharpened their knives for him. You know, just kind of, you know, let me help you. Let me help you that. Elijah made fun of him, saying, oh, maybe your God's on vacation. You know, he's on a trip or something. And maybe he's sleeping. Keep cutting yourself. Scream louder. When they tried with all their might and they were wore out, Elijah had him pour water on the altar and made sure it was real soaking wet a bunch of times. And, and then, of course, he called upon God one time and God answered with fire and the altar burned up and God showed that he is God. It was a huge victory. Okay? Elijah should be on top of the world. A number of things happen and rain starts coming. He tells Ahab, you better get back and uh, better get back uh, to Jezebel, <laughs> Jezreel, and and you better get back there, and the rain's going to come. And then Elijah takes off running. He's not in a chariot like Ahab is, and he gets there. If I remember the story right, he gets there before Ahab does. And then we see that Ahab tells Jezebel everything that happened. She's upset. She was always upset. You know, she was always upset about everything. And in chapter 19, what we see happen here in chapter 19, verse 2, uh, Jezebel sends a messenger to Elijah and basically says, I'm going to kill you. You're done. Well, you know, it's kind of ironic. If she really wanted to kill him, she could have just sent someone to kill him. But Elijah got scared and took off running. And, and we'll get to our text in a minute. And you can follow along. And I was kind of trying to go through quickly so I don't take up too much time because I'll probably take too much time anyway. So we'll try to, try to get through this a little faster. But it says in verse 3 that Elijah left his servant. He went, he left his servant behind, and now Elijah is alone. alone. Now, Elijah's already shown some uh, symptoms of self-pity. Back in chapter 18. I, I only. I'm the only one who's faithful to God. Now, you know, sometimes, sometimes as people serve God, we start feeling that way. And we start feeling sorry for ourselves because we work so hard. Nobody works as hard as I do. Nobody appreciates me. I'm the only one that does this. I'm the only one that's out there. And, you know, I just, I just don't think anybody knows everything I do. You know, the worst thing to do is go get alone, have a pity party. And this is what Elijah's doing. He's got a servant with him, but he tells the servant, park it there. I don't want anybody with me because I don't want anybody to encourage me. Okay? We had a missionary in Cambodia, a good guy named Ray Scholl, his son, missionary kid uh, now grew up and is back in Cambodia. When I say grew up, I mean he grew up. You know, he makes Ryan look small. He's a big guy. And, uh, but Ray, one time I went out and I was having a terrible time. I was supposed to meet him out fishing or having a day with the kids and enjoy time with the kids. And I had a three-wheeler that I was driving 
and uh, it broke down. It wouldn't start. I think we had a flat tire in the way. I got lost, and everything was going wrong, and I was grumpy, and I was feeling sorry for myself, and I was just, I was just really grumpy. By the time I got there, Brother Ray says, Hey, Brother Rodney, how's it going? I said, Terrible. And I started telling him all the problems I had. And this was typical for Brother Ray. It irritated fire on me. He'd say, Well, praise the Lord with all those bad things. God must be doing something good. And he'd say, Shut up right now, okay? <laughs> just, I'm trying to feel sorry for myself and have a bad attitude. Now just, 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 just shut up. Here you go, Pastor, uh, Dr. Dad, you know, he's always happy. And so you have tons of reasons. You, you have pain all over your body. Why don't you just complain a little bit? It makes me feel better about complaining myself. No. But Elijah got alone because he wanted to have a pity party. This reminds you what happened. There went under a juniper tree, verse 4, and he pouted. In verse 5 and 6, it says he fell asleep. In verse 5 and 6, it says the angel came, woke him up, fed him some food. He ate. And then you know what happened? He went back to sleep. This looks good. I like this so far. Okay, sleep, eat, sleep. And then what happens? Verse 7 and 8, the angel comes back, wakes him up again, feeds him some more. Yeah, sleep, eat, sleep, eat. This is good. Then the next thing that happens, he doesn't eat anything for 40 days. Never mind. This is, this is a bad idea. <laughs> I don't think I want to do that. So we come to verse 9 in our text. And Elijah's had a pity party. God has te taken care of his physical needs because oftentimes discouragement comes because we have physical needs. Oftentimes we get discouraged just because we're we're overworked, we're tired, and we need to sleep. Sometimes we get discouraged and depressed because we need nutrition or water. I've come back from long rides from the province and thirsty and hungry and dirty and I need a shower, and my wife wants to talk to me about something that's wrong, and I'm just like, not right now, hon, okay, because I'm getting irritated. Feed me, and my stomach's full, I'm going to be a lot better, okay? Just wait. She backs off a little bit, drink a gallon of water, eat a couple, you know, kilos, uh, kilograms of food, and, and then I'm okay. And she comes back. But this didn't work for Elijah because it wasn't just physical, it was spiritual. And we see in verse 9, it says, He came thither unto a cave. He lodged there, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your word, I pray that you'd help me and uh, lead and guide me as I preach and teach. Lord, I pray your passage, this, this word of, that came to us, Lord, from the Holy Spirit, I pray that your Holy Spirit would work in our lives now and make it alive. Apply it to us. Lord, use your word. Use me, your servant, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So the sermon's entitled, What Doest Thou here. What are you doing here? You know, spiritually, there's places that Christians don't belong. And Elijah was in a place he didn't belong. Feeling sorry for himself? Thinking that he was the only one? It's interesting. I want you to see his answer here. When Elijah answers and God said, what, when God said, what doest thou here? He didn't answer the question. That's pretty typical. Most time in the Bible, people just don't get God's questions and they avoid answering. But verse 10, he says, he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain the prophets with the sword. Now, what he says here is, I have been faithful to you when everybody else has not been faithful. They're all living wicked lives. They're all uh, worshiping idols. But I've stayed faithful to you, God. And now, he says, I, even I only, I'm the only one. I, I only, verse 10, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. So how does that answer the question, what doest thou here? Elijah was so caught up with what, number one, he had done. He was more focused on the things he had done for God than on the things God had done for him. That's not a good place to be. You know, I was, I've, uh, I've corrected a couple times. Sometimes people will say uh, that Jesus loved John the most. 
I say, where does it say that? Or, uh, uh, I'm sorry, that John loved Jesus the most. And uh, I say, no, where does it say that John was the one that loved Jesus the most? Because John never says the disciple that loved Jesus. He says, I'm the disciple that Jesus loved. Beloved. The beloved disciple. The one Jesus loved. He's not saying that Jesus didn't love anyone else. But he's just boasting that Jesus loved me. You know, when Peter got in trouble, Peter got in trouble for saying, hey, I'm never going to turn away from you. I'll be faithful to you. I love you, Jesus. And the next thing you know, he's betraying Christ. But towards the end of his life, John was writing the Gospel of John, and he says, the beloved disciple. And what he was saying is, Jesus loves me. And all throughout the Gospel of John, John keeps saying, Jesus loves me. He doesn't say, I love Jesus. Now, it's not wrong to say, I love Jesus. But I want you to understand that Jesus loves you more than you love him. And we'd better be careful when we start boasting about how much I love Jesus and how much I've done for him. What we should boast about is what God has done for us and how much he loves us, even though we don't deserve his love. But here we find Elijah in this place talking about how jealous, how zealous he's been for God. Proverbs 20, verse 6 says, Most men proclaim everyone his own goodness. Yeah, that's me too. Instead of proclaiming God's goodness. And here we find Elijah in a place when he's discouraged, feeling sorry for himself, and instead of boasting about all that God has done, didn't God just do something great? <laughs> It's like, wow, man, God, man, you, just, you just took care of those uh, 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 prophets of Baal and you showed all of Israel that you are God. Man, you are awesome, God. No, no, I've been jealous for you, God. Oh, that fire came from you, Elijah? I don't think so. So we get into this place, it's a bad place to be, when we start boasting of our own good works. We get into this place of comparing ourselves to other people who are betraying God, living wicked and unholy lives. Last Sunday, I was in a church in Chattanooga area, and I got to go to a Sunday school class. The teacher was really good, and he left it open for comments afterwards, and there were some things being said, and... I didn't like what somebody was saying. The teacher, I think he could see it on my face. Do you have something to say? It's like, I always have something to say. Okay, it's like, okay, it's like, you sure you want to open that one up? And so the guy was saying, you know, I don't know why the world judges us at a different standard than they judge themselves. I mean, we mess up. We're sinners. And we're just sinners saved by grace like they're sinners. So if we commit sin, they shouldn't judge us at a different standard. And I had to, I had to say, well, listen, we just learned that we're adopted. And we're sealed with the Holy Spirit from Ephesians chapter 1. The reason that we're held to a different standard is because we're God's children. I hold my children to a different standard than other people's children. If other people's children disobey, I just say, get out. Okay. If my children disobey, I put Ryan, yeah, over my knee right now. I mean, I'll put him on my knee, give him a whoop. Him. If he lets me, if he lets me. <laughs> no, we're held to a different standard. I said, what, what are you talking about? No. Yes, we're to be held to a different standard. God holds us to a different standard. Why would we compare ourselves to the world? We're not like the world. We have the Holy Spirit. We've been saved. We understand that the gospel is true, that Jesus Christ died on the cross for us, and he's going to take us to heaven when we die. Man, we have hope. We have the love of the Father, and we have faith in him. We're not the same. There is a different standard for us. But Elijah found himself in the place and comparing himself to the lost, the wicked. The unbelievers. Careful. That's a bad place to be. It's a bad place to be. We see here, and he says, I'm the only one. There's no one else but me. I'm the only faithful one. Man, Elijah was really stuck in a bad place. 
Can I, you can read Isaiah. If you read Isaiah, you'll see over and over and over God saying, I and only I, the Jehovah God, <laughs> am Savior, am God. There's only one who is unique, all-powerful, all-knowing, omniscient, and that's God. There's only one that everybody needs. That's God. And Elijah got this place. He thought, you know what? There's nobody else faithful to God but him. He got himself in a bad place. And then, <laughs> he was so bad, he said, they seek to take my life and take it away. Well, if you go back to under the juniper tree, he said he wanted to die. So what's the problem? He was having a pity party. Now, this was Elijah's answer to God. Elijah was having a hard time seeing God. He was having a hard time seeing God when God had just brought fire down from heaven to, to burn up the altar, when God just gave him victory. He's having a hard time seeing God when Obadiah just told him, there's a hundred other prophets that are hidden away. You're not the only one. But the only thing he can see is himself. So we see down in the next verse here, verse 11, the way God responds. And God, in this passage, we, we know he, he said, Go forth, stand upon the mount before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by in great and strong wind, rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after a wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. Sometimes we want to see like huge, mighty, powerful things happen. God bring fire down from heaven. And then it says, after the fire, a still small voice. And it was so, when Elias heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering of the cave. Now, I find this interesting. There's a huge wind, earthquake. I mean, there's rocks going down all over the place, and then a fire. I can't imagine the extreme heat. And when the still small voice comes, he covers his face. Can I tell you something? I'm just going to pause here for a minute. If you're a child of God and the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, when he speaks to you, that is a mighty, powerful thing. It's greater than lightning coming down. It's greater than the thunders of, in the heavens. It's greater than the fire at this mountain or strong winds or an earthquake. Greater than any, any hurricane. When God speaks to your heart, it's a mighty, powerful thing. And you have that. If you're a child of God, you have that. You may have learned how to ignore it. Or maybe you're so focused on yourself and you want to see some big and mighty thing that you can see with your eyes, but the Bible says we walk by faith, not by sight. And here this still small voice comes, and God himself is speaking to Elijah. And I pray God himself is speaking to you now. Elijah covers his face and he goes out, if you will, to meet God. And there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? Does God have amnesia? Does he forget? Did he forget that he already asked that question? No. Elijah gave the wrong answer. All Elijah could see was himself. Now what happened next is pretty incredible. I don't know about you, but I've flunked tests before. I was very happy about, uh, they made this kind of law in Michigan, I think when I was a kid, and you know, uh, if you got below 80%, you got to retake the test. I was really happy about that, that was cool. 
uh, for multiple reasons. Number one, I like second chances, sometimes need second chances. And, but this is what I do. We retake the test. Sometimes it was identical tests, like the very same questions in the very same order of like, yes, I love this teacher. This is great, you know. But I typically would not give the same answer that I got wrong on the first one. Okay? I'm stupid, but I'm not that stupid. Okay? But here we have Elijah. God says, what doest thou here, Elijah? And he says... God, I've been so jealous for you. I've, I've been working so hard. I've been faithful to you. The people of Israel have been wicked. I am the only one left. Now they seek to kill me. So God asked him again. This might seem familiar to you. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in a mantle. And he heard it said, what doest thou like? Verse 14, he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. Because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Now you might go back up to verse 10 and see that that's identical answer. So if that answer got you a fail the first time, sure enough it's going to get you a fail the second time. After fire, after the earthquake, after the strong wind, after God is now speaking to him, he, he still can't see God. He's seen what he does. And I know at the beginning I said, God doesn't need you, you need God. Elijah forgot that he needed God, and he's starting to get the wrong idea in his, in his head and thinks God needs him. And this is God's answer to that. And I want you to see what God says now. God doesn't send another wind or earthquake or fire. In verse 15, the Lord said to him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, anoint Haziel to be king over Syria. Different guy was king. But God says, you know what? The person who's king in Syria, I can change that. That's up to God. Verse 16, he says, And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, thou shalt, uh, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. Ahab was king over Israel. He said, you know what? God says, I can change that too. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abiel Mehobah. I have no idea how to say that name. I think he just called them dad. Right? So. But Elisha, what's he gonna be, God? I mean, Jude is another country? Uh, no. Shall anoint to be prophet in thy room. Let me put that in today's vernacular. Instead of you. You know what God just told him? I don't need the king of Syria. I can replace him with someone else. I, I don't need the king of Israel. I can replace him with someone else. And Elijah, I don't even need you. I can replace you with someone else. And when we start thinking we're irreplaceable to God, when we start thinking somehow God needs us, when we start thinking God's people need us, we have stepped into the place of God because God's people need God. You know, I, Pastor Willett did a great job transitioning everything over to Pastor Howell. During that same time, I was trying and still trying to transition New Hope Baptist Church so that, to put in Pastor Wong instead of myself, and we are still in that process. I personally found that to be a little bit difficult because I'm faced with a realization on a weekly basis that maybe the church doesn't need me anymore. But maybe the church never did need me. Maybe the church always needed God. I've said it, you know, many times. God doesn't need us. We need God. I've told the, the pastors, I said, your family needs you. It's more important. If God replaces me with another missionary, he can do that. But no one can be a dad to my kids but me. No one can be a husband to my wife but me. That's God's place for me. But someone else could pastor this church. I believe that with all my heart. But it was harder to do. 
sit. Somebody else leads music. Somebody else preaches. Somebody else leads the invitation. And I'm just sitting there. I don't know if you know me very well, but I don't do that very well. I don't sit very well. So I find reasons to be gone. Pastor Will doesn't have to find reasons to be gone. People ask him to go. Nobody asks me, okay? I have to ask them. I have to, can I, can I come visit your church? Yeah, you can sit in the back in the corner and you can come. That's fine. But you know, First Baptist Church of Bridgeport doesn't need Pastor Willette. We need God. Doreen, cover Pastor Howell's ears for a second, okay? First Baptist Church doesn't need Pastor Howell. We need God. A good pastor, Pastor Willette's done this for many, many years. He's taken our hand and he's led us to the hand of God. And the reason this church was able to transition well, because he never taught us to be dependent upon him, but to be dependent upon God. Oh, I miss him. I, I come back. Sometimes I come back. I'm like, man, I really like to see pastor. You know, I'm sorry. But I love seeing you too. Okay. <laughs> I walked by the office and he was in the office one, uh, one weekday. And it was just like, there's preacher. Oh, it's good to see him. And, uh, but the church needs God. One of these days, pastor will let God will take him to heaven we'll still be okay then too. Because the church needs God. One of these days, Lord willing, if the Lord tarries, Pastor Howell will have to transition, and as long as the church is still dependent on God and following him, we'll be okay then too. But Elijah, he forgot that. He shouldn't have forgot it. Because, oh, but I just told him there's a hundred more prophets. He just saw the power of God. God just, uh, just gave him great victory on Mount Carmel. God just gave him great victory or, or showed him his power through the earthquake and through the wind and through the fire. And then he spoke to him in a still, small voice. And still, still Elijah didn't get it. And if you're in a place in your life and the only thing you can see is yourself and you can't see the greatness and the power of God, you're in a bad place. God wants us to understand that we need him. Elijah was having a pity party. Interesting, verse 18, God kind of throws in for good measure. I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. Now, why is that in this passage? Well, simple. Elijah said, I'm the only one. And God said, you're not the only one. Now, just stop. Just get off your pity party there and... And understand, God is greater than you understand. Amen. You know, he does more than we can. He does more than you can understand. And you don't have to know everything God's doing to know he is God and he is still accomplishing his purpose. God often has to deal with his servants, and I've been one of those who are self-important. There's nothing important about us except that we serve an important God. <laughs> you know, sometimes I, I enjoyed, Brother Edwards talked about a man that he discipled, and that man ended up becoming a pastor. Now, Brother Edwards didn't call him to be a pastor. God did. And God used some other people to give him the training. And then later, that man's kids grew up and served God and did things. And I think, matter of fact, one of them knows uh, uh, Bethany Green and recommended her to come here. And uh, one of them came to Cambodia as a missionary. And I got to know them. And they asked me, do you know Lee Edwards? I'm like, sure I do. They told me the story first. I'm like, serious? Now, when Brother Ed tells that story, he keeps saying, God did this. He's right, because... He, he, didn't, he didn't do much of it at all. But Edwards just kind of like encouraged the guy, follow the Lord. 30 years ago plus, we were in the Orange Auditorium. I was trying to bring my friends to Christ. I was at Bertrand High School, and I, uh, Mark Strobel came with me probably the first year. He got saved, and he's in Florida now at uh, Pastor Rhodes Church down there, and Adam Zamora came, and 
Uh, he has started two churches, one in California and one in Arizona. And uh, honestly, with Adam, all I did is ask him to come to church. With Mark, all I did is ask him to come to a youth activity. And they didn't do much else. Good friends. I've kind of followed what God was doing in their life. There's a young man named Dan Rice. I uh, brought him to church. He was a junior in, in high school and invited him to church. First service he came, he got saved. He got so excited about God that uh, his dad wouldn't let him come anymore. He said it was a cult. That was half true, I guess, you know. But um, Dan still goes to church faithfully today. Him and I have kept in touch. He's, he's uh, prayed for me as we've gone to Cambodia. And these were things that I knew about. People that I was able to have some influence in their lives, kind of follow how things have gone. But, but there were a lot of people that I failed to reach. Uh, there were a lot of friends that stopped being my friends because one guy said to me, Rodney, all you want to talk about is church. I just, I just don't want that. His name was Danny. About eight years ago, I met Danny. He was on furlough, and, and, uh, and I said, hey, can I come see you? Yeah, where are you at? He told me, and so I went to see him, and I started witnessing to him again. He said, Rodney, we agree about a lot of things. And I said, we do? What are you talking about? He said, I accepted Christ a few years ago. I said, and I'm thinking, man, you know, it's because of all the times I witnessed to him. You know, he remembered a lot of things. I said, do you remember when I used to witness to you? No, I never listened to anything you said. He said, <laughs> 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 kind of like big heads like, <laughs> I'd say, uh, God doesn't need me to save Danny. Andrew came to church, sat in the front row with me, actually second row, like where Brother Howell was sitting, sat right with me. Andrew was uh, always with me in percussion. Matter of fact, he just recently told me that, um, he said he always kind of resented me because I'm what kept him from being first chair in percussion. And you say, why? Because I would, every time he'd start getting good, I'd hit his fingers with uh, drumsticks and break them, and he could never get past me then. And so I brought him. He sat right next to me. During the invitation, pastor is giving the invitation to get saved, and he's, he's weeping. He's got tears coming down his cheeks. And I say, Andrew, you want to get saved? And he said, why are you doing this to me? And I was like, uh, what do you mean? See, this is against everything I've ever been taught. He was Catholic. Well, he was right. It was. I went to his house and uh, later, and his mom didn't ask me in. It was weird. And uh, he said, wait here. Andrew came to the door. He said, what do you want, Rodney? I said, uh, I wanted to show you some things from the Bible. He said, I don't want to look at the Bible with you. He said, please don't come back. And I never did. Six months ago, I got a friend request from Andrew. He said, uh, and so, just a friend request on Facebook. And uh, I said, yes. Surprisingly, he wants to be my friend. And uh, there are people. <laughs> and I... Uh, <clears throat> I wanted to know what was going on. My wife kind of stalked him, you know, on Facebook. You know, I'm not very good at that. My wife is really good at stalking. Okay. If you don't want her to know, don't be her friend. Okay, she will stalk you. <laughs> she starts telling me, she said, Rodney, he goes to church. This looks like a gospel preaching church. He wrote this. He wrote this about not by works, by grace. I'm like, oh, that's not Catholic. He went on a mission trip this last summer in June. So I told my mom when I got home, I said, ah, I want to figure out where Andrew's at. Well, she knew his mom and dad and his brother and sister, his sister-in-law. So she made some phone calls, and she found out where he lived. And I went there to see him, knocked on his door, and they didn't answer. But there was a video camera outside, so I figured he probably knew who was standing there. And he told me not to come back, so I was back, you know. But I finally got a hold of him through Facebook, and we met last Saturday, yesterday, actually. No, Friday morning. We met Friday morning. And uh, he told me about two years after he came to church, he said, remember when I first started to understand about Christ was when I went to church with you. A couple years later, he got saved. 
And then God grew him, gave him a Christian wife. His kids go to a Christian school. He said, man, Brother Rupel, you're really good. No, he told me not to come back. All right? You get it? If it was up to me, he'd still be lost. God did that. You see, some sow, some water, some get to reap. Well, who rejoices? All of us. You know who gives the increase? God does. If we sow and water and reap without God, eh, we won't have any increase. Why? I'll tell you why. Because we need God. You know, if I wouldn't have brought Andrew to church that Sunday, would he have gotten saved? I have no idea. But God still knew who he was. God still loved him. God was seeking him out. Now, I want you to understand, if you have the honor and privilege, and you do, to serve our Lord and Savior, don't forget that it is our honor and our privilege. God is not privileged to have us. We are privileged to serve him. And it is amazing that God could use me. Because Andrew knew me before I got saved. But praise the Lord that God takes us worms and he can use us to reach other worms and point them to Christ. But God help me not to point people to myself. God help me to point people to the Lord Jesus Christ because people don't need me. People need God. And I need God. God doesn't need me. Especially when I forget that I need God. He tried to You know, God is patient with us. Thank the Lord. (laughs) God's patient with us, and he was patient with Elijah, but Elijah's not listening. Listen, don't go there. And if you're in that place, get out. It's a privilege and honor to serve God. God wants to use you. God will use you. But your focus has to be on him and pointing people to him. Let's pray. Well, God, thank you for your word. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for using us. Lord, help us to cast our affections on things above. Lord, help us not to proclaim our own goodness or boast of our own works. Help us not to compare ourselves to the lost. Help us, Lord, to boast of you and all that you do for us. Help us to give you glory. Help us to point people to you. I pray you'd show us where we've gotten self-centered, prideful, Lord, I pray you'd help us to stay humble before you and help us to serve you with joy. Whatever fruit we see right now, God, help us to be faithful to you for your sake in the Gospels. Lord, I ask and pray. We heads about and eyes closed. I just want to ask a few questions. Is there anybody here who's a Christian? You're saved, you're born again, you have the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit has spoken to you. And God wants you to get some things right with him. Is there anybody here like that? Raise your hand, I'll pray for you. Yeah, all over the auditorium. Some are already here at the front. Is there anybody here who, if you died today, you don't know for sure you go to heaven. But you'd like to know. Somebody will open the Bible and show you what the Bible has to say about how to go to heaven. Is there anybody here who doesn't know for sure if you died today, you go to heaven you'd like to know, just raise your hand until I see it, and I'll pray for you. Amen. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Lord God, help us to obey you at this time. I ask in Jesus' name.